Okay. Hello, Richard. Hi. Laura, hello. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you too. Thanks for joining me. It's it's sort of very amazing. I, we must be hours away in real, you know, distance <laughs> time, but it's very nice. It's like you're in my kitchen. So today I'm going to talk to you, you were very kindly agreed to talk to me about um, some things about teaching and and music and music teaching. And as you know, I run a a degree course at the University of Chichester and all of my students are training to be instrumental or vocal teachers and especially they've been working on one-to-one -one teaching and oh and the different pitfalls and the dilemmas that happen and I thought who better to ask than you with all your experience through education publication working with the exam boards um, you're really a perfect one to ask so well, very kind of you thank you so do you have any do you have any um, Oh, could you give us a tiny sentence or two about your experience in teaching? Yes, um, I, I started off as a, a classroom teacher and then moved into instrumental teaching. And I made the move because I thought instrumental teaching looked a much more attractive proposition. Spending all day playing music seemed uh, like the thing I wanted to do. And it was only when I started doing it as a full-time job, I realized just how difficult it is. Uh, working for a local authority music service, traveling from school to school, and the uncertainty of uh, whether children would turn up each week and what which room we'd be in and all of that stuff. Um, the logistics uh, posed a few challenges. And that was mostly group teaching as well. Um, and I can say now, with hindsight, that I think group teaching is in many respects uh, easier than one-to-one. -one. Why is that? Um, I think the one-to-one -one environment is a very pressured one um, because you, you have to deliver and the learner, in a sense, has to deliver as well. Uh, whereas in a group, you can, albeit momentarily, you can actually take a breather while a group of children do something or while the group is subdivided into smaller units to do things. Um, whereas if it's one-to-one, -one, um, it's either you or them and there ain't much else going to happen. No, indeed. So how did you, how much time did it take you to plan that sort of thing? You, if you had, I mean, as a professional um, teacher visiting schools, you don't have a lot of time in between things. No, no, and I would certainly acknowledge all my own shortcomings there in not doing enough planning, uh, in placing far too much reliance on a tutor book, a method book. Um, and of course, this is mostly pre-technology so the the most I could hope to have with me would be uh, a cassette player a tape player um, uh, or possibly if I was lucky in some schools being in a room where I could actually use uh, hi-fi equipment but most of the time um, it would be me and maybe a piano if I was lucky. But you've done a lot of studying and research on how people, musicians, learn to learn. Yeah, I spent quite a bit of time looking at that, particularly through my more recent work um, at ABRSM and running courses for teachers. And I've had the privilege and pleasure of watching probably thousands of lessons. Um, and the, the more I watch, the more I worry about the emphasis being too often on technique and notation both of which are very important. Heavens, I don't want to throw them away completely. Uh, but to get the balance right, particularly for the, the beginner learner. So do you mean even with, with classical learners, technique in notation? Because I can understand if you were learning um, pop music, you might not use notation. But do you mean classical as well? I think the reliance, yes I do. I think the reliance on notation in classical music uh, often means that notation becomes the music. And as a, as a player or performer, uh, really, the, the music happens when we lift the notes off the page. And a lot of the music happens in between the notes. And it's getting that stuff right that is, is crucial. For the absolute beginner, of course, the joy is uh, getting the notes out. That's, that's kind of phase one, as it were. And that's very important. And the, the buzz and the satisfaction comes from squirting out a row of uh, of dots on a page that makes a tune and that's what they want to do and that's great that's really important and it's fun um, to develop from there 
the, the key ingredient then is the oral skill, the development of oral skill. And that's the bit where I'm afraid the exam boards, by putting oral as a separate component, it often gets pushed down the list. And so for a lot of teachers, I've heard them say, oh, I, I can't do the oral today. I'll have to send you to, to so-and-so to get them to help you with the oral. When that begins to happen, we push that skill right down to the, at the end of the agenda, whereas it's the one we should be developing at the beginning. And I think that one of the ways to doing that is getting away from the notation and focusing on that oral stuff from the beginning. That's why I put the notation slightly down the, the, the list at the beginning. So how would you do that? I think a variety of things. I think, uh, for example, uh, playing uh, a melody to the learner or playing, it will be start with one note to the learner, getting them to copy, uh, getting them to imitate what you do, including the dynamics, the attack, the decay of the note, depend, depending on the instrument, of course. Um, getting them to, to add, uh, to, to copy what you do and to add to it, to complement it. Okay, it's a very old routine, the question and answer one, uh, and the call and response, but that gets them listening. We can then focus, if we've got more than one learner, we can focus uh, on providing a harmony for the, a melody that they're playing. And we can then focus on intonation and get them to think about whether it's E flat or D sharp, which for the string players is fine because they will, they will hear that more easily and the brass players will begin to as well. Um, for instruments where it's a fixed key like a, a clarinet or an oboe or a bassoon, it's very easy to believe that if you press the right uh, keys on the instrument or cover the right holes, the right note will come out. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it doesn't. Mm. But you can do all of that without even having a music stand between you and the, the student or the other yeah. person. I think that's really good because the music stand mentally and physically gets in the way and it becomes the object of worship. It the, the notes become the holy grail. And yeah, of course they are if we're playing a Tchaikovsky symphony or a, a whatever it happens to be. Um, but at the beginning, we need to sometimes take that obstacle away mm. and get children, beginners, to listen to one another, maybe to listen to us as, as players as well. I've seen that observing lessons where the teacher and the student will both be focused physically on the stand yes. instead of on either looking at noticing posture and what, the, what, you know, what physically the person's doing to produce the notes and also, as you say, really listening. Yeah. And after all, the, the audience is, is going to be listening in a performance. Yeah, the, the audience probably doesn't want to look at the notation. Uh, a, a few people in an audience may wish to because that's part of their learning style. But 99% of people, especially in a beginner's concert, will not want to see the notation. It's just, it, it's a prompt. It's no more than that. And if we can... Get away from that over-reliance on it. I think life gets better. Mm. Music gets better. But it's not a skill just for beginners either, is it? it? It's almost as important or more important, especially for people who've learned through that system uh, of putting oral a bit lower down the list. Um, and to, to acquire the skills of hearing something and playing it are terribly important. Um, I can think of an example of running a workshop where uh, a note was played and uh, the adult teachers were asked to just find that note on their instrument. And there were two people in the room who couldn't. And I think that's really pretty worrying, um, especially when one teacher played the wrong note but was very confident that it was the right note. Now, that that's an extreme example, and it might have been caused by fear or apprehension that the, the context of the learning. But I, th I think that's something that we need to be sure isn't there. And the way we're going to do that is to uh, use oral work in the right way, listening and copying and so on, uh, even for teachers and for adults. Mm. Because it can be such a positive thing to do, to take people to the next level and open their... Um their understanding about a piece of music, as you say, doing things in the right way. Because if a student does something and it's not right, simply saying that's the wrong note is far less effective than being able to, 
to show through the sound and illustrate that way. Yeah, and we, we want the learner to, to actually know when they've played a wrong note. We, we all play wrong notes. That's, that's unfortunately part of the human condition. And we play wrong notes, uh, perhaps by misreading, perhaps by uh, taking the wrong physical action. But we should be immediately aware. And we need to enhance that awareness amongst learners so that they can just acknowledge and say, yes, I did play the wrong note there, I misread it. I misfingered or, or whatever it happens to be um, uh, and it, it eliminates it from teaching and in, a, in, a, in an ideal world we shouldn't be inviting a learner to play something if we know they're going to play a wrong note mm. uh, why do we ask them to do that in other words we haven't got the music quite right or we haven't done the preparation for learning quite right mm. and that, those are things that are often missing mm. and focuses on noting mm. with that magic gift of hindsight if you can imagine the, the new music teacher focusing a lot on technique, how do you, how do you uh, convince, advise, help them to understand what other sorts of things are valuable to put into a lesson? Because sometimes people think, actually, if they're not teaching either the notes or how to do something faster, better, louder, then it's, it's not worthy of being in the lesson. One of the things I've done with... Um adults is to invite them to pick up a new instrument um, and watching what they do with this, especially if it can be recorded with permissions and so on, uh, watching what they do with this and watching them play wrong notes and find it really difficult is incredibly beneficial for them uh, because it reminds them then what it's like to be a beginner learner. Even though they have the benefit of all the musical knowledge, reading the notation is fine, understanding pulse, rhythm, context, harmony, everything else is fine, but they still can't play the right notes because this new instrument is so difficult. And I think that's, that's a, a really good way of actually exploring that. Have you had any, any fantastic um, eye-opening moments where you've done something in a lesson and you think actually that's a great technique that's a really good teaching tool and I'm going to remember that one I think the, the, the best things nearly always come from the learners and it's when you ask them to do something or sort something out quite often let's be honest because you can't think quite how to sort it out yourself they very often do it for you and you think hmm I will remember that, and next time I get uh, and I've painted myself into a corner with this bit of learning, I just ask them what they would do. And uh, alongside that, I'll ask them to teach me to see if they've really understood why we're having a problem with that bit. And that quite often reveals a misunderstanding. So those two things coupled together, I think, work very well. Mm, that's really interesting because, especially with beginners, sometimes people don't. Uh, invite them, allow them to contribute to the lesson in that way, thinking either they won't know what to say or who knows. I think it's really important to do that. Um, it's much easier not to. Mm. It's much easier to be seen as the authority within the room uh, and within the context. Um, but as it were, taking that first risk of inviting children to uh, explore it with you and explain how it works and so on, uh, it pays huge dividends. It, it allows you as a teacher to discover the bits they don't understand or the bits they've misunderstood or interpreted in a way that you didn't think was possible. So that, that is always very helpful, I think. Mm. What about understanding the achievement for a student? Sometimes young people, when they are learning things, they're really working hard and stuck in what they're doing. Have you, have you, how do you celebrate their achievement and help them to realize it? Because exams are one way, and they're a very good way, but um, they're very different to a public performance. And sometimes you, it's not um, either easy or appropriate to achieve a performance or an exam at the right moment. So how, how do you help students recognize what they've done well? I think it's to do with teasing out these four strands of playing, performing, achieving, and attaining. Uh, exams deal with attainment, and they deal with it quite effectively. Not perfectly, but quite effectively. And if you want to measure attainment, fine, use an exam if you wish to, and that, that will do the job for you. 
Um, I actually think you can do the job yourself, but if you want to use an external exam, that's fine. Uh, achievement um, is, is slightly more tricky because uh, we have to remind ourselves that for one learner, playing that particular thing is a massive achievement, whereas for the, the next learner, that would be something that they would just do very, very easily. Mm. And in the same way, we can invite someone to play something, maybe just um, playing, uh, it's, it's what I think of as kind of oats and beans syndrome, playing a very simple tune at the beginning, where the notes are okay, but it's no more a piece of music than uh, the actual uh, sheet of notation that they've got in front of them. And we have to move from playing it to performing it, where we try and get all the detail and nuance right. And if we kind of reward learners at keeping those four strands in mind, I think we can reward more carefully, rather than overpraising for something that is really not much more than a bit of a playthrough of a piece, which may be a huge achievement for one learner, may not be actually very much of an achievement for another one. So I think it's about keeping those four tracks in mind as we go along. And reminding ourselves as well, as if we needed reminding, that we're dealing in this subject that doesn't actually exist. I mean, we can't pick it up and look at it, unlike the artwork that they produce. And so asking them to remember uh, that they didn't play an F sharp in bar three is a big ask for a lot of learners. Mm. And that's why we need to develop those oral skills and to get away from the priority of the notation. Mm. It's really a big patchwork quilt, isn't it? And that balance is important. So if you have one bit that isn't there, you can have a big hole yes. and it'll fall apart. Yeah. But if, you know, so, when, it, when it does work together, it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And, and cherish the moment when it does. And, and, yes. and then, it, it, you know, hold a massive celebration for that, no matter how small achievement. Yes, uh, and for that person. And so, what, as you say, what will be celebrated for one person may not even come into the picture for another. And that's okay. Yes, exactly right. And one way of doing that is simply to uh, audio record a lesson and look at, make an audit of the language that you've used. And how many times have you said excellent, marvellous, wonderful, and actually it isn't really excellent or marvellous. It's pretty okay. It's, dare I use that wonderful Ofsted term, satisfactory. Uh, no, I won't use that. Okay. Uh, um, so we, could, you know, we, could, we can actually then begin to look at the range of language that we use um, without having to delve into their language, which is probably something that will be partially incomprehensible to us. Yes. Um, so when a child says it's sick, it might mean it's really good. <laughs> but, it <laughs> but it might not. But it might not. It might mean they're going to be sick again, in which case we take a completely different course of action. But I think that's a very, very good thing. I thought at first you were going to say record the lesson so that in three months' time the student could hear their progress. But as a reflective tool for the teacher, yeah. having an audit of what you're doing, that's a really valuable bit of insight. Mm -hmm. Yes, doing that, and yes, of course, recording uh, and asking the student to listen to it in three months' time, to say, let's see if we can really get that note in tune now, that one that you always find a bit difficult because it's technically more challenging on the instrument, or we have to, we have to rethink that note in, in performance. So uh, sometimes children, learners will say, I don't seem to be getting on very well with this, and we have to remind them, we say, well, Three months ago, you were playing down the wrong end of that instrument. <laughs> Quite a long way since then. Uh, and a bit of audio recording will go a long way with that, or, vi or video recording, if it's permissible. Yes. Yeah. That's great. It's really good. Any, uh, do you have any, um, anything else that you, any final things? We were, we're at uh, uh, just under 20 minutes, so I'm, I'm aware that you're being very generous with your time. But would, is there anything else to the new teachers that you'd like to leave them with? If you're going to use a method book or a tutor book, which we, we most of us do because it's easy to have one book for a learner, and they probably want to have a book, just be very careful that uh, when, we get to, when we're on the oats and beans stage, if they're finding that quite difficult, we might need to write our own tunes to add before we go on to the next stage. The kind of tune-a-day approach is fine for people who manage to rattle off a tune a day. 
But for those that find it more difficult, we may need supplementary material. And that is the key to success, rather than just turning over the page and going on to the next thing. Mm. Make space for learning. Mm. I think that's brilliant for the for the student as well as for the teacher. When a valuable bit of advice you gave me earlier was that it's important to um, to accept new knowledge from all the different areas. So I'm learning from you. You're not a cellist, uh, and and there I can learn from every instrument and from other teachers. So it's a really your time as and what you've shared with us is very valuable. I'm sure to all my students and other people listening. So. Well, thank very you. kind. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a great pleasure. Yeah. So thank you. And um, I hope to see you again soon. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you.